In today's video I will show you how I created these intricate patterns and text in titanium on glass. To deposit the titanium I will be using the sputtering setup I have built in a previous video. However, simply placing a slide over the magnetron would just yield a mirror. This means I need a method to prevent the titanium from reaching certain areas of the glass. For my initial attempts I utilized vinyl masks. Using my modified 3D printer, I could cut the mask from a vinyl sheet and stick it to the glass. After sputtering, the mask was peeled off, leaving a negative image on the glass. The downside here is that my level of detail is severely limited. My new method utilizes a photoresist, enabling me to create very fine structures as well. A photoresist is a special type of lacquer that is sensitive to UV radiation. There are positive and negative photoresists. Positive photoresist means that the area which has been exposed to UV radiation will get soluble in a developing solution, in my case potassium carbonate in distilled water. Negative photoresist means that the area that has been exposed won't be soluble in this developing solution. Here I have a microscope slide which has been coated in a dry film photoresist, not the lacquer I showed you earlier, I will later explain why I used the dry film. And I will just use this UV flashlight to demonstrate to you what happens when UV light hits the photoresist. As you can see, after a few seconds you can already see a discoloration at the area where the UV light hit the glass slide. And depending on whether you have a positive or negative photoresist, this area can either be washed away or will stay in the developing solution. In the beginning I was using this positive spray-on photoresist here. The problem with that is that it's basically impossible to get a coating with a uniform thickness, which then of course means that you need a different UV exposure time at different locations on the glass slide, which in return means that you don't get a uniform exposure. When using the spray on photoresist you either have to wait 24 hours or bake them at 70 degrees celsius for 15 minutes. But using this crude test piece here you can already see the problem. It collects at the edges of the glass slide and you don't get a uniform coating. I have also tried spin coating this photoresist. Spin coating is a method where you spin the glass slide very fast and through centrifugal forces the excess photoresist is pushed to the side. This way you get a very even and thin layer of photoresist. But I haven't had any success with that. It seems like the photoresist is not made to be spin coated. For a future video I will try to get some proper photoresist which can be spin coated because as you will see later the dry film photoresist has its own disadvantages. To selectively block the UV light from exposing areas you don't want to have exposed, you still need a mask. In my case, these masks will be made using a household printer. But there are also a lot of caveats creating these masks. In my first attempts, I've used this transparent paper here. It's not the plastic type, because the plastic type takes up ink worse than this type you can see right here. In an ideal world, the black areas wouldn't let any light through. But since it's not an ideal world, they will leave light through. By holding them against a light, you can see that the black area is actually somewhat transparent. This is fairly unfortunate because we will inevitably also expose the area under the black text. An inkjet printer actually performs a lot better than a laser printer, but it's not good enough either. I then tried gluing two identical printouts together to block more light, that of course decreased the light getting through the black areas, but when having very fine structures the alignment gets difficult and it's still not perfect. I then remembered watching a video from Applied Science about, I think, electrochemical machining and to create his masks he was using the screen printing paper here. This screen printing paper has an emulsion on one side which I can dissolve using IPA. This special coating on one side of the transparent paper enables it to take up a lot more ink than it would normally be able to. It's of course still not a perfect black, but if you compare them to the normal transparent paper against the light you can see the huge difference. So I created all my masks with this screen printing paper. To have clean microscope slides which I can later coat, I keep them in a solution of potassium hydroxide in IPA for a few days. This will remove most of the organic contamination on the slides and you should really wear gloves and especially eye protection when working with IPA and potassium hydroxide solutions because they are pretty nasty. I then just take them out and rinse them with IPA and distilled water. It is very important to use distilled water as your last step because even if you are using 99.99% pure IPA, it will leave some residue. A good indicator for how clean your glass surface is is the water break test. If the water forms droplets, this means that there is still some hydrophobic residue on your glass and it's still contaminated. If you can coat the whole glass surface with an even layer of water, it means that most of the contamination is gone. You can also see that if I take a clean glass slide and place a drop of water on it, 
It can be easily spread into a uniform layer on the glass surface without forming drops. If you compare this to this unclean glass slide, you can see that the water forms droplets due to the hydrophobic surface contamination and does not want to form a uniform layer of water on the glass slide. After rinsing the microscope slides with distilled water, I dry them using a hot air gun. When drying the microscope slides with a hot air gun, I try to first push most of the water down to the edge and soak it up with a paper towel. I want as little water as possible evaporating on the surface and leaving any residue. Now that we have the clean glass slides, it is time to apply the photoresist. As I've explained earlier, I have switched to using a dry film photoresist to get a uniform thickness. The photoresist comes on these rolls here and can be cut into suitably sized pieces. Normally I'm only working with the photoresist under safe light. For that I have exchanged the LED lights on my workbench lights. I think you can actually work with the photoresist under normal household lighting conditions as long as you are not exposing it to any sunlight, but I wanted to be extra sure that I'm not exposing any area I don't want to have exposed, which is why I'm working under the safe light. But for this video I will use the normal light in the room so you can see better what I'm doing. The dry film photoresist can be applied to the glass surface using a laminator like this one. I just bought the cheapest one I could find on Amazon. To guide the microscope slide through the laminator I'm using a piece of paper like this one. The actual photoresist is between two protective layers and one of those layers has to be removed before it can adhere to the glass surface. To do that I will simply use two pieces of tape and stick them to the corner of the photoresist on opposite sides. And if I now pull apart the tape, the layer protecting the adhesive side of the photoresist should peel away. You can see a very thin plastic foil being removed from the photoresist. The next important step is that you do not want to push the photoresist onto the glass surface. You basically want it hovering above the microscope slide. If you at this step push it down to the glass surface, you will get bubbles between the glass and the photoresist. The paper with the glass slide and the photoresist can then be carefully inserted into the laminator. At this point I would like to thank the YouTube channel Projects in Flight for his fantastic video on photolithography for etching silicon. His tips on handling the dry film photoresist have probably saved me a lot of time. All of his videos are highly recommended and I have linked the channel in the video description. And with a little bit of luck you get a perfectly smooth surface without any air inclusions between the photoresist and the glass surface. I then just cut away the paper and the excess photoresist to get the glass slide which is ready to be exposed. To expose the photoresist I'm using this 100 watt LED UV light on top here. I placed it about 67 centimeters above the table. In theory the further away the light source is the better, but 67 centimeters is the height of my lab stand here and I haven't had any problems with it. I then place the microscope slide on the glass plate and align the mask above it. As you can see the text on the mask is actually mirrored. The reason for that is that I want the printed surface as close to the photoresist as possible. If the text would be the right way around I would have to place it on the glass slide like this, which means there is a certain distance between the printed area and the photoresist, to be precise the thickness of the transparent paper. Having this additional thickness between the mask or the printed text on the mask and the actual photoresist means that the shadow will be less crisp. I can simply avoid that by mirroring the text and placing it directly onto the photoresist. I then place this assembly on a black surface to minimize the reflection of UV light which will expose areas that I don't want exposed. I then expose the photoresist for 35 seconds. How long the photoresist needs to be exposed depends on a lot of different factors. Your light source, the distance from the light source to the photoresist, the mask you're using, the photoresist you're using, so you basically have to find the perfect exposure time for your setup. After exposing the photoresist you can already faintly see the text, which means now it is time to develop the photoresist. But before doing that it is very important to remove the second protective layer I have talked about earlier. What you are actually using as your development solution depends on the photoresist and you should refer to the datasheet. The actual development time also depends on a lot of different factors and you just have to play around a little bit with your exposure time and your development time to find the sweet spot. 
It is important to note that the development solution actually dissolves both developed and undeveloped photoresist, but one of them, in case of the negative photoresist, the developed photoresist dissolves a lot slower than the undeveloped one. That's also the reason why I'm using this brush to brush the glass surface. I am removing the residue from the dissolved photoresist to speed up the process, otherwise we would start to dissolve the developed photoresist too. And you can actually be fairly aggressive with a soft brush. I haven't had any problems with removing photoresist I didn't want to remove, but I had problems with leftover photoresist in the undeveloped locations that prevented the titanium from adhering to the glass. After the development, I again rinse the glass light with distilled water and dry it with my hot air gun. After the development, you can see that we have removed all of the photoresist which hasn't been exposed to UV light. Here you can see the vacuum chamber from the inside. The assembly right here is the so-called magnetron, which I will use to deposit titanium onto the glass slides. In the middle of the magnetron, you can see the so-called target. It is a disk of the metal you want to deposit onto a different surface. In my case, it is a disk of titanium and I will now mount the glass slides above the magnetron. As you can see, the glass slides are mounted on a vacuum rotary feed-through. The reason for that is that I want them to be away from the magnetron when I remove the titanium oxide layer. Even though the disc looks clean, due to contact with atmospheric oxygen and moisture, there is a thin layer of titanium oxide on the titanium disc. And I first have to let the magnetron run for a while to get rid of this oxide layer. Only then I will rotate the glass slides above the magnetron so we can deposit pure titanium metal onto the glass. In the back here you can see an argon bottle which provides the argon that I use as a sputtering gas. Using this manual gas flow meter here, I can control the argon flow into the chamber and thus the pressure inside the chamber. Now that the roughing pump has lowered the pressure of the chamber to about 1 millibar, I can start the turbomolecular pump. It is always very cool to see the pressure suddenly drop when the turbomolecular pump spins up. I'm not sure why the graph is currently not working, but it doesn't matter, you can see the pressure drop right here. Now that the turbomolecular pump is up to speed, I will introduce argon into the chamber to get a pressure of about 2 times 10 to the power of minus 2 millibars. Now that we have reached the desired pressure, I will use my power supply to create a plasma above the magnetron. If you want to know in more detail how this process works, I recommend watching my video about magnetron sputtering. But to keep it short, we are creating a plasma above the target. In this plasma, there are positively charged argon atoms, which are accelerated towards the target due to its negative potential. When hitting the surface of the target, these argon atoms can, due to their kinetic energy, eject titanium atoms out of the metal disc. These titanium atoms will then fly through the vacuum until they hit a surface where they can condense. In our case, this would be the glass slides. It is hard to see on camera, but after a while the plasma will turn a beautiful blue color. So now I can use the rotary feed-through to place the glass slides in front of the magnetron. Let's take a look at how the results have turned out. Interesting. It seems like I have seamlessly transitioned into mentioning the sponsor of today's video. Since I don't own a milling machine or a lathe, I had no way to manufacture the components for my magnetron myself. However, fortunately, PCBWay not only offers PCB manufacturing, but also provides services such as 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding, and CNC machining. You simply upload your file on their website, choose the desired material from a variety of options, and receive an initial price estimate right away. After placing your order, you will have your part in your hands a few days later. And there is nothing quite like the feeling of holding a self-designed component for the first time. You will find a link to their website in the video description. A big thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Now, let's see what has actually become of the slides in the chamber. Here you can see both examples coated in titanium. So let's remove the photoresist to see the final result. To remove the leftover photoresist, you need a solvent like for example acetone. In my experience, it is best to not brush the surface to remove the photoresist, but to just leave it in the solvent until it lifts off on its own.
To give you some sense of scale, I have placed a human hair on the microscope slide and you can see that it is about the thickness or a little bit thinner than the eye. I have also created a few of those test patterns here to see at which point the details get completely lost. And you can see that at the point where the details reach the thickness of a human hair, we have a lot of defects. Another interesting test piece are these converging lines here. You can see that at the beginning the lines are relatively well defined, but if we go lower where the lines converge, you can see more and more defects and at a certain point you will see that they start to fuse together because we have removed photoresist um, we didn't want to remove. And yeah, down here it's basically just a mess. To find out what my limiting factor for the resolution is, let's compare the glass slide to the mask I have used to create this pattern. This right here is the mask that I have used. And if we compare it to the titanium layer on the glass slide, you can see that we carried over a lot of the imperfections. And if we go further down, you can actually see that the mask itself is very fuzzy. There is no way I'm getting discrete um, exposure on the photoresist using this mask right here. If we go further down, you can faintly make out the lines, but there is no way we are getting a crisp shadow using this mask here. This is the text I showed you earlier, and let's compare it to the mask I have used to create it. As you can see, the mask itself is very spotty and there's no way I'm getting a good shadow of this mask. So I think I actually reached the resolution of my inkjet printer and it's not the process that's hindering me in creating smaller details. I have of course seen the video by Applied Science where he used an analog camera to take a picture of a text form on his wall and the resolution he was able to achieve was just mind-blowing. So I'm very far away from that, but if you want to feel bad, you can always compare yourself to Applied Science. By the way, I will link the video in the video description. I may do that in a future video, but if you have any other ideas how I could increase the resolution of my mask, let me know in the comments. All in all, I am very happy with the results. You can also use the titanium layer as an adhesion layer for other metals. The PCBWay logo, for example, is silver on a titanium adhesion layer. But even though I'm using titanium as an adhesion layer, the silver can scratch pretty easily when touching it. I looked around for a silver target but couldn't find any that were in my budget. So I just used a silver coin. I had to reduce the diameter a little bit, but now it fits perfectly. And it's a good alternative if you don't want to buy an overpriced silver target. Before I end today's video, I really want to thank my Patreons. Your financial support makes my videos possible. And it really means the world to me that you have decided that I am worth spending your money on. If you want to become a Patreon too, you can find a link in the video description. Other than that, thank you a lot for watching.